absent for the moment. Festerson? Here. Gurnett? Here. Gray? Here. Jerem? Here. Stothard? Here. Mr. President? Here. Uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for our invocation by... Oh, Council Franklin's here. Vice President Gary Gurnett. Here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a moment of silence for our military personnel, both past and present, especially those that are serving here and abroad. Lord, we pray with joy and thankfulness for your mercy to us as we begin our earthly work. Amen. Amen. City Clerk certifies publication of the daily record on June 15th. Notice for a pre-council and regular city council meeting June 19th, 2012. A current copy of the Open Meetings Act is posted in a white binder on the east wall of the legislative chambers. Good afternoon and welcome. This Omaha City Council meeting is conducted in public and by law may only address the topics listed on the published agenda. The council will hear testimony but will not engage in debate of issues with the public at this meeting. Oh yeah? I had the same thing this morning. <laughs> How appropriate. During testimony it is not appropriate to applaud or convey disapproval. These actions only detract from the formal decorum of the meeting. At this time, please turn off or mute any electronic device. Mr. Clerk. Uh, zoning ordinance and final reading planning board attachments, item number five, ordinance to rezone property located at 2714-16 North 52nd Street from R435 to R5 Urban Family Residential District. A planning board and planning department recommend approval. Public hearing on agenda item number five begins now. Are there any proponents? Right. Well, the owner. Yes, sir. Please state your name and address. Charles Christensen, 2714 North 52nd Street. Um, do you want a full presentation, or can I answer any questions that you got? Perfect. It's if if you're available for questions, that'd be fine. Yes, I'm available for questions. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Passed 7 to 0. Items 6 and 7 are one case. 6 is ordinance to rezone property located generally southwest of 132nd and 4th Streets from MU to R6 low density multifamily residential district. A planning board and planning department recommend approval. And 7 is ordinance to approve a PUD planned unit overlay district uh, at the same location, A planning board and planning department recommend approval. Public hearing on agenda items number <clears throat> number six and seven begin now. Are there any proponents? Yes, Mr. President, members of the council, Larry Jobin, 11440 West Center Road, appearing on behalf of the American Heritage, or American Italian Heritage Society, here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Jobin. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Motion to approve. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. They're both passed 7 to 0. Item number 8, ordinance to amend a number of sections in Chapter 55 regarding urban design. A, Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing on agenda item number 8 begins now. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Dothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Passed 7 to 0. Pursuant to City Council Rule 70, agenda items 9 through 11 should be laid over for two weeks. Item number 12, resolution of preliminary plat entitled I'll get uh, estates located northeast of 69th and McKinley Street is hereby accepted in preparation of final plat is hereby authorized. A planning board, planning department recommend approval. Public hearing on agenda item number 12 begins now. Are there any proponents? Uh, Brian Lotus with Thompson, Dreesen, Dorner, uh, 10836 Old Mill Road, uh, here on behalf of the applicant, 
any questions, I can answer them. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? The public hearing is closed. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's adopted six to zero, or seven to zero. Pursuant to City Council Rule 70, agenda item number 13 through 14 should be laid over two weeks for publication and public hearing. Item number 15 is a plat and dedication of strip of land along the southeast corner of uh, lot 7, block 39, original City of Omaha, located northeast of 10th and Dodge Street. A Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing on agenda item number 15 begins now. Are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's approved 7 to 0. Liquor, item number 16. Come and go, number 378 at 14353 Q Street. A package liquor license. New application, new location. Public hearing on agenda item number 16 begins now. Are there any proponents? Yes, good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the council. My name is Sean Kelly, 7134 Pacific Street, appearing today on behalf of Come and Go. This is their uh, newest location in the metro area, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. The liquor manager and store manager are present if you have questions for them. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Yeah. Festerson? Yes. Yeah. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. And Mr. Jerem passes a second time for potential conflict of interest. It's adopted 601 passing. Item number 17 is a Sinclair at 5215 North 16th Street. Package liquor license, new application, new location. Public I did, hearing. Oh, I did receive one phone call opposing. Public hearing on agenda item number 17 begins now. Are there any proponents? Oh, there's also. Hi, man. <coughs> Excuse me. Name is Kasim. Address is 5215 North 16th Street. I'm here for any questions. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Yes. <coughs> Please state your name and address. John Dillard, 4938 North 15th, Omaha. Uh, in this area, we have a problem with drugs and alcohol at present. There are far too many liquor licenses in the area already as it is. You've got a restaurant with a liquor license, which is okay. There's a bar, which not so much. There's Chubbs up the road. They have a liquor license. There's a liquor license down at a, I think it's a Sinclair station, about 10 blocks down the road. and. Late at night, I found, I've noticed teenage drunks and adult drunks wandering the street late at night. Since this location has been closed, I've noticed a lot fewer. And I have my objections written out. Yeah. If, we have a cop. You, you, yeah. we, they, and it's, we have arsons in the area, teen gang wannabes, mindless violence, and it's all alcohol and drug related. And alcohol is a mind altering substance. It's a legalized substance, but still it's pretty much this, very similar. And uh, any new liquor license in the area would be a very bad idea. It finds its way into teen alcoholics, teen drunks, and older alcoholics that just don't seem to be able to handle what they do. And I'm opposed to any new liquor license. Everyone has the right to make a living. The gas station is fine, I guess. But to bring alcohol into it, it's not a good idea. And it's a gas station. You fill your car up there. Is there a log drinking and driving? You know, that's a policy of the state they do. I don't know why. I think it's uh, contradictory. But more alcohol into that area is just throwing fuel on the fire. It's a very bad idea. Just say no, please. Thank you, sir. Are there any other opponents? Public hearing is closed. Council Member Gray. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> if I could have you on, if you can come up, please. 
couple of questions that I want to ask you. You're looking for a Class C liquor license. What, what, is, your, what is it your intention to sell? Are, is, it, is it your intention to sell all alcohol across the board? No, sir. It's, it's, it's just any other gas station business. Uh, what we're wanting to do is package beer and uh, liquor. That's, that's what our intentions are. Okay. And are, are you – here's my concern. Yes, sir. I have the same concern that the neighbor has, um, except that I'm willing to give you a, a chance. But in order for me to do that, um, I need some assurances from you, and, and one of those has to be the, the problem that he's describing right. is a problem where quite often you, we have individuals in the neighborhood that use your store as a, as a refrigerator, so to speak. Right. They get their single bottles, their single cans, their airplane shots, that sort of thing. Is it your intention to sell those? Single bottles, cans, and those airplane shots. No, sir. Just packaged beer is what we're wanting to sell, and I have six packs, twelve packs, that sort of thing. Things. Right, sir. Okay. And see, I have eleven years of experience. I have no violations under my belt for any sale to a minor. Okay. Um, I've trained quite a few people, and I've always told them that's the first thing. Now, violence in the neighborhood—that's something I cannot control. But I can assure you that there will be nothing. No, I mean, like like the gentleman described, that there's illegal activity like drugs and stuff like that, but there will be nothing like that in my place of business. That's, mm -hmm. the, you know, and um, like he said that, the, you know, everything else can be sold, but the problem is a gas station relies on the beer sales quite a bit. Mm -hmm. You know that's that's about thirty three to forty percent of the business. And, and I understand that, but I'm just but but I also understand that selling those single bottles and cans are are exactly what this resident is talking about. Uh, we will not sell them. It'll be six packs and twelve packs and something that you can only take home, but nothing like on the property. There will be no consumption on premises. Okay, I just want to get the resident down for a minute because I um, we have studied this for. Come on back down. We've we've studied this for a period of time. Several of us on. The this council have and and what, what we realize to be the problem more than anything else is not so much the sales it's depending on how you make those sales and a lot of them have to do with those single bottles those single cans and those airplane shots that people can get go outside drink throw it over somebody's fence go back in and get another one that sort of thing that's the thing we're trying to stop I respectfully disagree it's any alcohol sales in the area you can't stop it all but having it that close and that available and taking it home is a great deal of the problem. Or taking it to the street corner, you know, four, four or five blocks down the road. You know, I don't expect to prevail here, but I raise an objection. I'm right, win or lose. And I, just I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you, but I'm saying in terms of business, I, I would like to give the gentleman a shot as long as he's going to abide by no single bottles, no single cans, none of those airplane shots that people can take out, take behind the place and drink and come back and get another one or what. They can't use the store as a refrigerator is what I'm saying. I realize what's going to happen here. Okay. But furthermore, just having it available that readily, it will make it to the hands of miners. It's not his fault. Mm -hmm. you know, he's new to the area. He's an outsider. He's not in the area. The problem is the alcohol, not the individual. And 60% of the income to the C store, that's a large portion, and it's expected. Yeah. That's a 60% increase in the area mm -hmm. for that location. Yeah, I don't disagree, but I don't, I'm not in the, I'm, I don't disagree with your analysis. I just don't know that we ought to be in the business of running people out of business before we give them a good chance at it. Uh, and with those, with the six packs, the twelve packs, and those sorts of things, let me give you an example. We did one. We 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 set up one exactly on on 30th and Lake. Now, I took a lot of grief for that initially, but they are operating very well. And three of us on the council went and visited that store, and they're doing very well, and they're not having any of the problems, and they're not selling those single bottles, cans, and airplane shots. When the alcohol leaves the store. The store has no control over it. Mm -hmm. The store doesn't know what's happening. By checking the store itself, you're not checking the problem I'm seeking of. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he's a very reputable businessman, and I'm sure he'll do everything legal. Okay. Legal and illegal is not the problem. The problem is to increase mind-altering substance in a neighborhood will increase all of what I've mentioned. Okay, Violence and and, and we can and we can revisit that if we have to. We, we have a liquor committee, and we, we we will revisit that if we have to. I don't expect right to prevail here, but uh, okay, it is what it is. Okay, I am right. Thank you. All right, thank you.
Can I get you back up one more time and just very briefly? Um, I just wanted you to agree, want you to agree for the record. No, sick, no single cans, bottles, and airplane shots. Right. The only thing we will sell there will be six packs, twelve packs, and eighteen packs. Okay. And just for reference, we have another uh, location down the street from it, which is on uh, Lucas and Tenth Street. Uh, we've been running it for three years, haven't had any problems, no minor sales, nothing like that. So. Okay. You know, we we're in the area doing business. You know, not not to. Do the okay. Stuff. Yeah. If if you will stipulate to that, I've learned from my colleagues sitting on my right here that we just give you we we, we need to give you at least a chance. So I I, uh, I really appreciate it. Yes. Uh, I, I make a motion to approve, Mr. President. Oh, we have to amend. For it. Well, we have to amend. You don't have to amend that. I think just that he is because he stipulated that he will not have any singles. So motion approved. Second to the stipulation. Yep. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gurnat? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerome? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's adopted 6 or 7 0. We'll take items. Thank you. For oh, no. Thank you, I, item number 18. M's Pub at 422 South 11th Street, a catering liquor license to application location. They per currently hold a Class C liquor license. Public hearing on agenda item number 18 begins now. Are there any proponents? Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the council. My name is Ron Samuelson. I'm the co-owner of M's Pub in the Old Market. My home address is 6056 Country Club Oaks Place in Omaha. I'll be here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, sir. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gurnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerome? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Adopted 7 0. Mm -hmm. We'll take items 19, 20, and 21 together for a public hearing, but individual votes. They're all dealing with the Creighton campus. 19 is a Sodexo Marriott, or Sodexo America, LLC, DBA, Ryan Center, Morrison Stadium, 701. Florence Boulevard, Class I liquor license, new application, new location. There is a request from the attorney to amend that to a Class C. 20 is the Alumni Sports Cafe at 602 North 20th Street. Request permission for an addition to their present Class I K liquor license location to, for the entire building. And 21 is the Kiewit Fitness Center Student Center at 2400 Cass Street. Request permission for an addition to their present Class I K liquor license for the entire building. Public hearing on agenda items number 19, 20, and 21 begin now. Are there any proponents? Mr. President, members of the council, my name is Sean Kelly, 7134 Pacific Street, appearing today on behalf of Sodexo America LLC. To my left is Ed Luby, uh, the liquor license manager on behalf of Sodexo America LLC. Um, as you may be aware, these applications are coming in response to an overwhelming number of applications uh, for special designated licenses. Uh, as these premises, the, the two that have already been licensed will, with the addition and with the new application, we'll be able to limit the number of SDLs that are applied for uh, each year. So with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. There are representatives uh, from Creighton University here as well, if you have any questions for them. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Council members. Council Member Stothard. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Can you come back up? I think you're going to have to say your name again. Sure. John <laughs> Kelly, 7134 Pacific Street. I was waiting for the question. <laughs> just for anyone listening, could you just primarily um, explain what type of events are being held that there is the need for the liquor licenses on campus? If it's sold in a restaurant or a bar there, or what it is that you are doing that you need the liquor license. Could you just explain it, that? Absolutely. The overwhelming majority of uh, alcohol consumption on, on Creighton University's campus uh, is for receptions, whether that's a wedding reception or an alumni reception or the reception to welcome Father Lanham back to Omaha. Uh, that's just a brief example of, of what type of events do occur there. There is an alumni sports um, grill. Uh, in the Harper Center, that does serve alcohol, but they do band uh, and actually ID uh, on numerous occasions, not just the first time you enter. So they do keep a really close control uh, of alcohol consumption and sales on campus uh, with Sodexo America and with, with public safety as well. 
Okay, and already events like these alumni events and such and receptions, they're already occurring on campus, they're already serving alcohol, but they have to each time go down and get a special designated license, and this would prevent them from the need to do that. Right, and thanks for the clarification. Uh, you actually won't see much more alcohol consumption on the Creighton University campus because of these licenses. The consumption is already occurring through the use of SDLs, but as a permanently licensed facility, uh, both the city and the Liquor Control Commission will have more control and more oversight over these locations and the different events that, that do occur on campus. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Roll call. This is on item 19. We'll take an individual. 19, Thompson? Yeah. What? Oh, I'm sorry. 19, there's an amendment on 19 to amend it to a Class C. So moves. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Uh, Jerome? Yes. Okay. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. And Jerome passes a second time for a potential conflict of interest. Now, as amended on 19? As amended. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem passes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. And Jerem passes a second time for a potential conflict of interest. Now, item number 20. Motion approved. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem passes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. And uh, Jerem passes a second time. It's 601 passing. Item number 21. Motion approved. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerome passes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. And Jerome passes a second time for a potential conflict of interest. It's approved. 601 passing. Item number 22, Rolling River, River City Star. 151 Freedom Park Road, request permission for a special day's license for a beer garden at that location on September 2nd from noon to 1 a.m. with music ending at 1 a.m. Public hearing on agenda item number 22 begins now. Are there any proponents? Uh, Amy Parch, 151 Freedom Park Road, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Okay. Music at one. Uh, did we want to talk oh, about music. it? I'm sorry. Labor, labor there. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Um, to my colleagues, I think every once in a while there's a, uh, an exception to the rule, and this being Labor Day and it's on the on the river, I just think sometimes you have to have an exception, and I'm okay with one o'clock. Okay. Motion approved. Know that it's on the river. It says Rear Garden. 151 Freedom Park Road. Is it? It's, it's on the. <laughs> it's the River City site. <laughs> Do we have a set? <laughs> we need a stationary, or are we, 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 are we float? We'll have no, you come down. We'll have you come down to straighten it out for <laughs> uh, Stationary on the landing facility. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> we need a second. We have a second. Motion a second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gurnat? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It is approved 7-0. Item number 23. Resolution that effective 30 days after the adoption of this resolution, the Class C liquor license held by Stir Enterprises Entertainment Enterprise Incorporated DBA Barfly 707 North 114th Street is hereby canceled for the reasons set forth. A is of communications from uh, the Executive Director of the Nebraska Liquor Control Commission. Uh, Mr. Mumpgard, if you would please, would you uh, uh, address the council and tell us the uh, agreement that uh, you've got worked out with the uh, owners of the Barfly? Certainly. Tom Mumgard, Deputy City Attorney. <clears throat> this is the second half of a cancellation process that you began back in uh, February of this year. Uh, at that point, cancellation was commenced because of some problems that had uh, occurred over the past, uh, principally last summer, where police were, re were re regularly being called to this bar uh, to respond to disturbances and fights that were in the parking lot. <clears throat> um, 
over the last three months, um, that situation has calmed down. There's been a change in ownership in a nearby bar. Uh, the police report that there's only been one incident since then. As a result of that calming down, um, we have worked out an agreement with the bar owner. You have a choice today. You can go forward with your cancellation, and if you feel that the violations are severe enough, can cancel the license, that will be appealable to the Liquor Control Commission. Or you can accept the stipulation and agreement that the bar has agreed to. That essentially is a probation agreement that for the next uh, approximately 16 months they would remain on probation. Uh, they would, if there is a violation of law, they could be called in first to the liquor committee and then to you for several options. One, you would retain your right to cancel or revoke their license. Uh, in addition, you would gain the right to suspend their license. You currently do not have that authority under state law. This agreement uh, gives you the ability to suspend their license for a number of days, uh, depending on the nature of the disturbance and the severity, anywhere from five to 30 days. Uh, that's following a schedule that has been adopted by the Liquor Control Commission. If you do suspend their license under the state law, they have the option of paying a fine or uh, principally paying a fine instead of closing. This agreement gives you a little bit more teeth that you can decide either to impose the fine, let them pay a fine in lieu of suspension, or impose a mandatory closure. So if there is an event uh, in the next uh, 16 months uh, at this bar, uh, you don't have to go all the way to a cancellation. You can, for example, uh, impose a mandatory closure of five to ten days. Uh, the bar would be closed during that time period. Uh, they would not have an appeal of that to the State Liquor Control Commission. They would have to appeal directly to court if they wished. So this gives you a new avenue to address any problems that might arise in the next uh, 16 months. Thank you, sir. Uh, is there anyone here that would like to tes testify today, proponents or opponents? Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Tomka, 5555 South 27th Street, Suite A in Lincoln. Um, I'm with Boucher Law Firm and I represent the Barfly. Um, and as Mr. Mumgard indicated, we have come to an agreement uh, concerning uh, giving the commission, giving the council the opportunity and the ability to, I guess, kind of follow what, for lack of a better word, a progressive disciplinary schedule, similar to what the Lincoln, what, what the Liquor Commission Control Commission does um, statewide. And um, as also as Mr. Mumgard said, that this this uh, stipulation is an opportunity for the bar flight to continue as it has been for the last three a little over three months um, where we kind of caught a break, got a continuance of that cancellation hearing, and have since then uh, have uh, chased away, I could say, the element that was causing a lot of the problems. It also helped that, again, the fedora was under new ma management, new ownership, and that has also helped as the owners have worked together to basically clean up that area, clean up the bars in that area, and to continue on in that route. Um, so we are asking that you do adopt the stipulation and agreement um, versus canceling the um, license. I'm available for questions, as is Ed Rutledge, the owner of the bar. Thank you. Thank you. Public hearing is closed. Uh, Council Member Thompson. Yes, Mr. President, I know that you met with a uh, group at 1.30, and I was wondering, were you happy with what you heard? Yes, I think uh, uh, kudos to Mr. Mumgard for coming up with this new agreement. I think this gives the council a, a different tool, uh, a, a progressive tool to handle situations like this. And uh, I'm most comfortable with the, uh, the owner's uh, commitment to follow through with that agreement. Well, this is uh, experimental for us and for the uh, liquor committee. So, uh, if you're happy with it, then I'm, I'd be willing to uh, move the approval. Actually, and this is the approval. That's, 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 so, actually, we're going to place it on we'll file. Place this on file. The okay. the agreement will pl place in the record as a permanent record. Okay. It's been signed. So, move to place on file. Yep. Okay. Roll call. Thompson. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Garnett. I know. I, and I'll go along with the group. Yes. 
Gray? Yes. Yeah. Jerem? Stothard? Yes. Yeah. Mr. President? Yes. It is adopted six to one. Item number 24, resolution that effective 30 days after the adoption of this resolution, a Class C liquor license held by THT Incorporated DBA Fedora's Lounge, 711-713 North 114th Street, is hereby canceled for reasons set forth. And on this one, to, THT no longer has a liquor license, so we need to place this on file. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gurnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's placed on file yes. 7 to 0. Consent agenda. Any member of the City Council may cause an item placed on the consent agenda to be removed. Items removed consent agenda shall be taken up by the City Council immediately following the consent agenda in the order in which they were removed unless otherwise provided by the City Council rules of order. The public hearings on agenda items numbers 25 through 34 were held on June the 12th, 2012. Second. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Gurnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Stothard? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Uh, ordinances 25 through 34 were passed 7 to 0. The public hearings on agenda items numbers 35 through 39 and 42 through 52 are today. If you wish to address the City Council regarding these items, please come to the microphone, indicate the agenda item number you wish to address, identify yourself by name, <clears throat> address who you represent, and if you are a proponent or opponent. Public hearing is closed. Roll call. Thompson? Yes. Festerson? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Stothert? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Items 35 through 39, 42 through 52 are all adopted 7 to 0. Now items, item number 40, resolution at amendment number 5 to the professional service agreement for the implementation of the combined sewer overflow long-term control plan with CH2M Hill for provision of additional services to address impact relating to the 2011 Missouri River flood is hereby approved. Public hearing on agenda item number 40 begins now. Are there any proponents? Marty Great, Public Works Department, here to answer any questions you may have about this. Uh, Marty, uh, would, would you mind just expounding a little bit? Just to, uh, We want to make sure that the general public has, sure. has an idea. I mean, you know, what, there's been a lot of conversation about the com combined sewer operation and the large expense that's going to be to the city of Omaha. And, and th this agenda item and the next agenda item may bring yeah. efficiencies so that it may not cost the city of Omaha the, that great of an amount of money. So if you could just expand on that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, as you're well aware, we're facing a $1.7 billion federal mandate to improve our sewer system and decrease overflows of raw sewage to the river and the Papillion Creek. Uh, the amendment that's before you today is an amendment to what we call our program management team. Um, that's a group of consultants that help us administer the program and do some limited design work on some special projects. The amendment today, more specifically, 80% of the funding in that is directly attributable to the uh, flooding that occurred last year. We now need to do some additional design work and some additional contract administration, construction monitoring, because we need to kind of uh, improve our plan so that we're better in better shape to withstand the kind of flood conditions that we saw last year and had never envisioned seeing before. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Council Member Jerem. Thank you, Mr. Great. Um, as I understand, and I don't know if you glanced over this, but the original lifespan of the project has been extended by the Nebraska Department of Environment, Environmental Quality by three years. Is that correct? Yeah, what happened was 
last June when we realized the magnitude of the flooding and the impact it was going to have on this program is that we notified the state of Nebraska that we considered this under the terms of our consent order to be a force majeure kind of act of God condition. And at that time, we couldn't really determine what the impact exactly was going to be, but we knew that it had a, a, a it was going to have a big impact. Well, this spring, we've been negotiating with the state, and just recently, they agreed that, yes, it was a force majeure condition and that it's appropriate to give us three additional years on top of the 15 years that we're allowed to construct this project. And as I understand it, item 41 will, through this contract, begin to measure pollutants in the discharge area south of our South Omaha treatment plant in terms of giving us the data to let us know how effective the measures are that we're implementing in terms of reducing the pollutants that flow into the river. Yes, we'll be monitoring both at locations downstream of the city and also throughout the city and upstream so we can see how that water quality changes and also track any improvements that might occur. And I take it from what your goal is here is to perhaps have the data that would support an argument to the DEQ to perhaps form the basis to amend the consent decree in a way that would lessen the overall scope of the project and by lessening the scope of the project, hopefully the cost of the project to the taxpayers. Yeah, we, we spend a lot of time and, and effort and money in developing our long-term control plan. Um, but we had to make a lot of presumptions when we put that plan together. Now that we're in the process of implementing that, that plan, we really need to demonstrate what we're accomplishing. And like you said, the hope is that we can demonstrate that we're making greater strides than what we presumed we would, and therefore maybe we can do less on the backside of the program at, towards the end. Now, in terms of the actual uh, project itself, um, what, if any, uh, efforts are you taking or the consultants taking or others to determine whether there's um, environment EPA grants or other source funding that might help lessen the burden of um, the cost of the project yeah. to the taxpayers? In general, this, this program is considered an unfunded federal mandate, um, but like item 41 on the agenda, the USGS uh, monitoring, they are contributing $117,000 of funding into that program, which we will benefit from. We've also been working recently with EPA's Office of Research and Development, and they've, they've agreed to commit $200,000 worth of effort to try to help us look at maybe some green alternatives to some of our gray infrastructure and try to see if we can come up with less costly ways to accomplish our water quality goals. And as you say, you continue to reassess the program and its implementation, and I'd like to commend you for that to try to lessen the cost. Um, but I'd also ask you to reassess the project in terms of the rate structure insofar as the interrelation between industrial water users and commercial water users uh, with regard to looking at what the Red Oak um, consultants said originally is what they recommended um, because I think that there are concerns primarily from the large water users, the industrials, that believe there's a disparate uh, impact upon them and the rate structure uh, versus the commercial water users below them um, in terms of seeing if there's a more equitable way to address the cost structure between those two, uh, which would still leave the residential customers alone in terms of the rates uh, recommended. Uh, would you agree to, to look at that? Yes, we have been looking at that, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. Mr. Grenant. Marty, items 40 and 41 are the continued effort to what we saw, what the flood did to us above ground. We had no clue at that time what was going to happen below that water line, did we? No, and uh, but we did even during the flooding. We knew that we had some damage to our infrastructure. So again, we're just still kind of fully assessing that, but it did impact our underground infrastructure. And with 40 and 41, uh, basically maybe 41 more, we as a city, we should uh, be putting our best effort forward to make sure we know 
what's going on in that river all of the time. So we're a, not behind the eight ball, but ahead of the game and ahead of the curve uh, now and in the future. I agree totally. We anticipate, um, I know that we lost uh, uh, pumping stations. Uh, I remember where we had to send a diver down mm -hmm. during the flood to find out where we, we didn't know that there was a relief valve right. in, in the dike that was missed. And that diver had to go back down and plug it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a possibility of, of even more now that the river has gone back within its banks. Is there still a, a highly likelihood that we can find even more, or are we at a point where we're putting measures in place to deal with the things that we've found and maybe find a few more that will have uh, measures in place to take care of any future things? There's always I, a possibility. I worry about that immensely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got the wastewater treatment plant in my area, and I saw the operation. Mm -hmm. I watched those guys work up a lot of sweat putting in that new, that temporary berm. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure that we're following a set of, uh, or we're within the guidelines, but still having that foresight to catch those things and have measures in place to take care of them. Yeah, I think you can always, you always stand a chance of finding something that pops up that you didn't catch right away, but we did a very thorough review of the levee and the surrounding infrastructure with the Corps of Army Corps of Engineers, and uh, they have committed $15 million to bringing that levee back up to standards and to repair a lot of that damage. Uh, in addition to that, we spent in the flood fight uh, almost $37 million in both preventive measures and now repair efforts. Um, and we think we have a really good handle on it. We think our levy is, again, in good shape. Uh, but that's a dynamic thing. We continue to review all of our infrastructure on an ongoing basis. But I don't think we will we'll have any big surprises at this point. Well, I think the public n needs to know that uh, we have that constant eye out and that uh, the elected officials here are making sure that uh, public works have those tools and measures in place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, sir. Ms. Stothert. Thanks, Mr. Great. I just want you to clarify. Um, I think people listening might assume, since there was a three-year extension granted by the NDEQ, that that might mean the payments are spread out and the payments might be lower or the cost to the customer. But with this additional amount we're spending, that's not really the case, right? And we, you need to explain that. Yeah, it's, it's going to alter the cash flow. It's not necessarily going to save money, uh, mm -hmm. but it may allow us to, to cover some of these repair costs without a, a big hit right now. We've got about a year from the state to really figure out how we want to take advantage of that three-year uh, extension, mm -hmm. which projects really need to be impacted, and which ones we can continue on at the normal rate. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Roll call. Thompson. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Grant. Yes. Gray. Yes. Jerem. Yes. Stothard. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Adopted 7 to 0. Now, item 41, resolution that the joint funding agreement and proposal for water quality monitoring between the city and the U.S. Ge Geological Sur Survey for water quality monitoring from the Missouri River along Douglas and Sarpy counties is hereby approved. Motion approved. Second. Roll call. Thompson. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Garnett. Yes. Gray. Yes. Jerome. Yes. Stothard. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Adopted 7 to 0. Pursuant to City Council Rule 7H, due to no meeting being held July 10th, agenda item number 53 shall be laid over four weeks to July 17th for publication of public hearing. Pursuant to City Council Rule 70, the public hearing agenda item number 54 through 57 shall be held on the second reading. Ordinances on second reading, item number 58, ordinance to approve the execution of an interest rate buy-down agreement with the People's Choice Federal Credit Union to provide home energy efficiency financing and support program administration for the re-energized program. Public hearing on agenda item number 58 begins now. Are there any proponents? Hi, I'm Christy Walmstead Evans, uh, 1819 Farnham Street, Suite 311. I'm the Sustainability Coordinator for the City of Omaha. 
and the program director for the Re-Energize program, um, who is managing this agreement. Uh, this is agreement I wanted to kind of come explain a little bit about um, what this agreement is uh, going to do. Uh, because it's fairly unique in terms of agreements that we've had with the city in the past. Um, one of the issues that we're trying to um, overcome for the Re-Energize program are barriers to financing. So for market rate for participants that uh, want to come in and uh, take advantage of some of the incentives, they still need to find funding to supplement uh, the financial incentives we can offer. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is help them overcome barriers to financing. This interest rate uh, buy-down agreement will reduce whatever rate they might be quoted by that credit union by an additional 2%. So we're providing really an enhanced financing mechanism uh, for participants that choose to use that mechanism. Um, this particular agreement is with People's Choice, which is based in the city of Lincoln. Lincoln is a partner of ours with the Re-Energize program. This uh, agreement with People's Choice uh, really only covers the people that live in Lincoln, but since Omaha is the administrator for the grant, we're, this needs to pass through, uh, through this board. Um, there is a very similar agreement that's in place with Centrist Federal Credit Union that was passed back in, I think, January. Um, basically the exact same language. So we're trying to replicate a model in both communities that is equitable and uh, kind of represents a balance uh, for our communities. Um, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Good afternoon, I'm Milo Mumgard, uh, senior aide to Mayor Chris Beitler in the city of Lincoln, uh, 555 South 10th Street in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, I am uh, the cohort to Christy Wamstad Evans in Lincoln in terms of making sure the administration, the Re-Energize program uh, does the job we set out to do. And, and I must say it really is at this point being a successful program. We have really been reaching into the markets into both Omaha and Lincoln. Uh, and this particular uh, item on your agenda will enable People's Choice Credit Union in Lincoln to do a similar uh, uh, impact type uh, lending that Centris is doing here in Omaha. Uh, People's Choice is the credit union, uh, its origins as a credit union, is the Lincoln City Employees Credit Union. Uh, but of course it's expanded and it's now a countywide uh, credit union, has access to um, literally hundreds of potential folks to take advantage of the Re-Energize program. We'll be able to uh, use these funds in a, in a real uh, speedy and adequate manner and, and we look forward to putting this into place in the next few months, next few weeks really. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other proponents? Are there any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Mr. Jerem. Yes, I just want to say, um, first at the outset, I support the uh, item on the agenda, but um, over the last uh, couple weeks, you know, I've learned some information about the implementation of this program, and I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't uh, express some uh, disappointment in terms of the ability of the program to achieve the goals that it set out to do at the outset. And um, I understand and it's laudable that this is one of the things you're, you're doing to try to uh, increase the participation level and on this particular item for the city of Lincoln like you did with Centris in, in Omaha. Um, but there are other barriers too, um, and when you have a participation rate that has the levels that have been provided to me by staff upon inquiry, um, as well as other obstacles in terms uh, that have existed, uh, in terms of uh, primarily where these energy issues exist in the poorest of the poor neighborhoods in the city, and yet people were being charged a $300 plus assessment fee at a time, um, you know, in, and we had public, public relations issues in terms of advertising and promoting the program, and when you look at the type and the amount of money remaining left to um, spend in the time remaining in the grant, um, I don't know if alarming is the right term, but certainly astounding. Um, disappointment on my part that the purpose of this program is not moving or achieving the type of results I think would be fair to expect from it. So having 
uh, and, and I appreciate the information you've provided to staff. You've been uh, very cooperative. I think you've acknowledged uh, your concerns and your efforts and desires to increase the productivity of the grant program. Um, but what personally can you tell the council here and the, and the uh, people listening to this program, mm -hmm. watching us, what you intend to do as the administrator of it to make sure that w the funds that we've been awarded actually get put uh, to good use for the people who need it the most in, with the most uh, energy inefficient homes in the city. Right. And I think one thing that's really important to note about this grant program was that it's not a typical grant program that's come out from, um, that is intended to focus on low income populations. Uh, this grant specifically was to build a market. Uh, the DOE's call for this competitive grant was to build uh, or, or to create market transformation. Uh, the City of Omaha, working with the City of Lincoln, was one of 42 recipients, and that was out of 180 applications. So we basically, the, what we submitted was a very strong idea that a lot of people recognized that would help build up not only getting, doing work, performing work within our communities, but at the same point leveraging that work with increasing a skilled workforce, developing a skilled workforce, increasing financing opportunities, and really focusing on quality workmanship rather than getting the, done, the job done fast. Um, I would say that a lot of what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to spend fast, but we've also been trying to spend well um, with these, these funds. Uh, and that can be difficult at times. There are a lot of overlapping, you know, kind of considerations that come into place when you take a look at a federal grant program and some of the city stipulations and some of the other pieces that kind of come into that. Now you add that a participant needs to invest their own dollars um, and at a time when our economy is really struggling in many ways, even though Omaha and Lincoln are much better than other parts of the country, it still is a big decision for someone to make an investment in their home and wanting to make these energy improvements and seeing that the uh, the energy savings will, will occur. We have been working through all of these processes. I mean, part of what I'm thinking is that this grant program is doing exactly what it was intended to do, which would be work through the barriers that exist to having this market stand up on its own into the future. Some of the things, though, I do recognize what you're saying as far as our participation levels and that we're trying to identify what some of the limitations have been, why people have not been jumping, wanting to get into this program, and how do we remove those barriers while still building up the market, still providing contractors confidence that people are willing to make investments in this because without that confidence, contractors won't go out, they won't get trained, they won't, um, they won't make the additional effort to understand whole building science. Um, given that, one of the things that we are doing, uh, last Friday we rolled out uh, a new low to moderate income component of our program. So we have a market rate component, really where people are going to have to find the financing, but we provide a very, very um, attractive incentive of $100 per percentage of energy savings achieved. So that's, uh, that already exists on the market rate side. On the low to moderate income, we've just rolled out a program this Friday. We held a workshop with all of our energy evaluators, the people who can actually go through and do kind of the whole building um, assessments. And they are ready to go out and at $100 for the investment of the low to moderate income individual, at $100 we'll provide up to $3,000 of energy uh, upgrades as well as the cost of the energy evaluation, which is market rate of $400 to $600. We anticipate trying to target 720 individuals with this, with two-thirds of those individuals or those uh, homes coming from Omaha and one-third coming from Lincoln. We've already uh, started coordinating with a number of groups that um, manage multiple properties that are low to moderate income and um, are looking at doing some bulk, quick turnaround uh, work with them to get these projects up and running and, um, and, and to really change, turn around the participation numbers. Thank you for that explanation. That's all I have for you. Thank you. Um, 
when I hear you say that, or the administration say we're achieving exactly what we set out to do, and you look at the data that I've seen in terms of the dollars remaining to spent, the amount of time uh, left to achieve it, the amount of uh, retrofitted homes, I, ha I don't think I've seen the data yet on the amount of uh, job force that we've created because of this. I know of the one big one in North Omaha that already existed. Uh, I think it's Energy Star or something like that. Um, but um, I, I, I would hope you understand my um, uh, disagreement with that representation that we're achieving exactly what we set out to do. Uh, I think that there's a lot of work left to, to do on this to achieve what the program set out to do. And quite frankly, I would be uh, delighted but surprised if it were to achieve in the time remaining what, what was allocated to be done. And I would hope that one of the things I would have heard a few moments ago was, you know, we got into this program and it's, it's had a steep learning curve to it that perhaps the people administrating this program had not encountered or anticipated the barriers that would have existed um, and that the shortcomings were being addressed with, uh, with all uh, haste and a forthrightness in order to get the properties that need um, this retrofitting and the uh, contractors who need the training um, the skills and the services necessary so that the program achieves the desired outcome. I mean, it's a $10 million grant shared with Lincoln, rough dollars, and no one would like to see, see it succeed more than this council. Um, in speaking with my colleagues uh, and in the comments made at the time that the acceptance of the grant was approved, um, but, you know, had it not been for the remarkable coincidence of some constituent contact near the time that these agenda items had come before us, you know, I wonder if we would have ever known what we were doing in this program. And it's something really, whether it's uh, um, achieving what we exactly what we set out to do or something short of that, I guess that is in the terms of the judgment of the person reviewing the data. Um, so for that extent, um, I support this item. Um, I wish there had been some, now that I've seen the data, some earlier efforts given the limited time remaining in this program um, to get where I think we need to be. That's my opinion from looking at the information that was provided to me. I would like to thank my staff, uh, particularly Dean Miller, for getting this information, and for you for providing it. Thank you. Council Member Gray. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> and I'm not gonna go over all of the comments that were made by my, by my, uh, my colleague who just finished, but let me just say, let me just, rather than echo, let me just say ditto. Um, I'm, I'm disappointed in where we are, quite frankly. And I mentioned this to the president earlier today, and I'm, I'm, I'm really disappointed in where we are. But let me ask a question in terms of wh where, we, where we're going now. When we, when, we, um, ask, when, we, when, we, when we ask people to apply for loans, are they, going to, are they going to be held to the same standards in terms of credit worthiness and some of the other things? And what, and, and what specifically are they going to be What's, what specific amount are they going to have to come up with in either a loan or out of their own pockets? What, what, what dollar total do they need to come up with? The underwriting criteria will be determined by the financial institutions. We did try early on, spent probably about a year and a half working to negotiate some other um, alternative al underwriting criteria, and we just were not able to find uh, agreement with the financial institutions. Okay, so the financial institutions are basically, going, are, are, are basically going to follow the same criteria that they've, all, that they've followed up to now? They will set the criteria, and what this will do is, so if, if someone was to go in, and um, typically they would be quoted 11%. Uh, 
interest rate on a loan um, that would draw down that loan by two more percent, so they would get it for nine percent instead of. What, it, what is the loan? What? How much money are you asking them to apply for? It's going to vary based on how much energy savings is achieved. When you install an air conditioner, um, it's a very high cost, but it's very low energy savings. Actually, you don't achieve as much energy savings as you would for attic insulation or some other item, and so you're going to see kind of a greater energy savings or a greater incentive associated with things like attic insulation. So the cost or the loan size that someone applies for will vary based on what their home particularly needs or what they, they've chosen. Let me, let, me put it to, let me give you a hypothetical and tell me how you would respond to this. Um, and either of you can answer this. But let's say you have an individual, let's say you have someone that because as I understand what you do, and I've talked to a couple of individuals that actually do this, and what they go in and do is they do an energy survey. Mm -hmm. And they say, you don't need an air con what, what, what you need is attic insulation. What you need is uh, some other areas inside the house that don't, y if you do those things, then they don't need air conditioners and that sort of thing. Right. So at, at the end of the day, when you tell, when they t when you tell them what the energy, what, what, what is going to best serve the needs of that family in that house, um, what will they, and, and they agree to do it. They agree, yeah. okay, I don't need an air conditioner, I don't need these. Right. So what, what, what would we be asking for them to try and apply for in terms of funding? So if, let's say, for, for instance, that a project costs $6,000, mm -hmm. so all of the things together and what gets quoted back is $6,000, and they're going to save 25% on that, so 25% of their energy, based on what the energy evaluation um, calculates. So that's $2,500. So they'll have the $6,000 minus the $2,500, so they would come up with $3,500. So nearly half of that project would be covered. Okay, and then what happens with the low income? People? The low to moderate income is slightly different in that there's not as much choice. They can't opt in to, I want an air conditioner, I wanted a furnace. There is uh, a list of things that we say, you know, for $100 will provide you the energy evaluation and we will do, we'll have the energy evaluator go out and they'll identify the most cost effective things to do up to the $3,000. Okay. But it will also include three items that are health and safety that have no energy savings but are really critical for any home, which includes a CO monitor, um, a dryer vent, uh, properly vented, and uh, fixing any natural gas leaks that if it, any of those situations exist because there's combustible appliances in the home, that will be um, required. Okay, but everything else is that on, a, on a sliding scale then? In other words, if they have $6,000 worth of things that need to be done, I'm not talking about air conditioning and, and those sorts of things. I'm talking about if, if they have $6,000 worth of work to be done um, that will generate 25% in energy savings, what are they going to have to apply for? For the low to moderate income, they're not going to have to apply. I mean, that, those are additional items that could go above, but they're not considered cost effective. And so there might be health and safety items, we might refer them to the city's uh, RAP program, to the housing community development that focuses more on health and safety items within the home that also could have an energy feature. But we're focusing on what is the most cost effective. How can we achieve the greatest energy savings at the lowest cost so that we can distribute these funds um, across many, many people? Okay. And my concern is that there's been a considerable amount of credit damage that has been done to a number of people. Yeah. That's why I'm asking if if they're going to be some if they're going to be some some different criteria for acquiring the loan and how you pay that back. Yeah. Please. Uh, Milo Mungard, City of Lincoln. Uh, the reason that People's Choice Credit Union was selected as the credit union to work with in Lincoln is because they are they work with the City of Lincoln to create a very dynamic and very uh, um, successful alternative to payday lending uh, program where they've actually reached into that community of low to moderate income people and credit risks and things of that nature and have actually made hundreds of loans now under that alternative program and that's a model for what we're talking about with respect to the lending that's going to take place under this program and hopefully more broadly people's choice may find that this is actually a, a situation they want to continue for a long time but this will get this out of the out of the chute modeled upon a lot of the concerns you just talked about okay and, and uh, I know at least one company that um, said they at least claimed they could have done significantly more work than they're getting. And I don't know how that whole process works. Uh, but again, in terms of some of the contractors I know that do the work, where we are at this point, 
Um, I have to echo Councilman Jerem's uh, comments and concerns um, because I'm a little I'm a little disappointed in where we are right now. But you know, I'm but I'm willing to support this as well. Um, but I need f on, on the record to say you know where we where my feelings about this and where we are and and what needs to occur and and I'm not I'm I'm a little. I'm a little uncomfortable right now with even with the upgrade that we've made at this point that we're not going to get the people that we think we're going to get. Um, I, I just think we could have I just think we could have done this better. But we're, we are where we are, and I, I'm going to be supportive of this. But I do share the same concerns as Councilmember Jerem. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Grant, Kristen, do we? Uh, In the unlikely event that uh, we don't make the 2,100 structures, I believe was the original goal. The goal, yes. Okay. And we have less than 12 months left to do get this done, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. We have to give whatever money is left back to the federal government at a specific time. Whatever funds that we have not drawn down. Um, the, we don't currently hold all of those funds. What we do is we submit, once we have payment, we submit it and we can receive reimbursement from the government. Okay. Well, as my previous colleagues have stated, I do support this, but I would urge that we get a bigger buggy whip out on this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the numbers just don't, and I've, I told you this in the planning committee that uh, when we start giving money back, uh, from programs, even though that, that this has been a moving target program for a specific market. Uh, I don't want to set a precedent when we go after other pr program funds that are available from the federal government. Uh, so let, let, let's find a bigger bug, buggy whip and, and get going. So I'd call the question. Motion approved. Uh, this is second. Public hearing. No. Public hearing only. Oh, public hearing. Disregard that call. Okay. Mr. Clerk. Pursuant to City Council Rule 7D, the public hearing on agenda items 59 shall be held in third reading. Pursuant to City Council Rule 7C, the public hearing on agenda items number 60 through 64 shall be held on the second reading. Motion to Roll call. Thompson. Yes. Festerson. Yes. Garnett. Yes. Trey. Yes. Jerem. Yes. Stother. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. 307. Thank you.